I am so excited about what I'm going to talk about today because while it wasn't easy initially, um, it's been really, really life-changing. It's really changed my relationship with food and um, it's vastly improved my health over the last three years or so. Hey, feeling good, like I should. Today, I'm going to talk about intermittent fasting for beginners, um, for those who are just starting to maybe flirt with the idea of fasting, um, or maybe you've dabbled in it a little already and um, you really just want to understand this method of eating, or not eating, as it were. In this specific video, I'm going to talk about what happens in your body when you fast so that you can better understand the potential health benefits of fasting, and then you can decide whether you want to try it and or continue doing it. If you're new to my channel, welcome. My name is Nikki. I have a master's degree in microbiology and molecular genetics from UCLA. And I absolutely love making science-based videos about health and wellness. Thanks so much for stopping by. And if you like what you see here today and you want to see more, please subscribe and hit the notification bell. All right, my history with intermittent fasting. Let's go back in time about six years when I was eating a shake for breakfast, a huge lunch, and a huge dinner. Now, looking at all five foot nothing of me, uh, you may think how huge were her meals really? Well, let's start with my shake, which you can watch all about here in this video. It talks about all of the uh, health benefits of all of the different ingredients. It's a great shake, really healthy, and at the time it was like 500 calories. Now it's probably closer to maybe three or 400 calories since I've made some adjustments. Anyway, for lunch, I used to order this vegan salad that was 868 calories, but here's the kicker. I wouldn't stop there, oh no. I would add a side of buttermilk fried chicken and a bowl of roasted tomato soup, complete with croutons and a drizzle of olive oil. And I would eat all of it, all of it. Leave no crouton behind was my motto. So if you're counting so far for breakfast and lunch alone, I was already up to almost 2000 calories. Now, according to the Mayo Clinic calorie counter, for someone my height, activity level, and age at the time, I should have only been consuming 1500 calories total a day. I haven't even talked about dinner. So not shockingly, I was 10 pounds heavier, but because I was still within the normal range for people my height and age, I wasn't too worried though my physique was a little more sausage-like. Oh, along with my three squares a day, I also snacked as much as possible from morning until night because I thought it was helping to keep my metabolism high, a mentality I'd had forever. It's a fallacy, by the way. It's just not true. Eating all day long actually taxes our pancreas and our digestive systems. So at some point, I needed a come to Jesus moment. I was eating way too much food and I was well on my way to diabetesville and heart attack town. Well, one day back in 2018, my husband saw um, a video on YouTube about intermittent fasting and we were both really intrigued, actually. Um, there seemed to be some viable science behind intermittent fasting, not just for weight loss, but also for mitigating inflammation and therefore chronic disease, um, improving mental clarity, etc. So I tried it. It sucked at first. It sucked at first. It was hard. I was cranky. I was super hungry from the time I woke up until the time I finally broke my fast. Not snacking at night might have been the worst part. It sucked. And I know I'm not really selling this, but stick with me. So it was like that for a couple weeks. I'm actually shocked that I stuck with it. Knowing me then, I never would have thought I'd stick with something that didn't allow me a nightly peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Some days would be not so bad, and other days I was like a ravenous menstruating T-Rex. It was really challenging during my period. Like, just so hungry and so angry. My poor husband, my poor emotionally battered husband. But somehow each day it got a tiny bit easier. I just wanted to see if I could do it, you know? And I really did want to um, start setting some boundaries with food and doing a fast seemed uh, much easier to me than counting calories and macros. I've tried it, it's a lot of work. Or depriving myself of carbs, never gonna happen. Sorry, keto. I started by stopping eating um, at 7 p.m. and then not eating until around 10 a.m. the next morning. So that was like a 15 hour fast. It took me maybe a month or so to eventually work my way up to 16 hours fasting 
and an eight hour eating window. Fast forward three years and now I'm up to an 18 hour fast most days of the week. Weekends are, you know, weekends are hard. More recently, I started doing 24 hour fasts, which honestly isn't as hard as I thought it would be. And this is coming from somebody who three years ago thought she was starving at hour eight. Before we move on, this is probably a good time for a disclaimer. Always consult with your healthcare professional before starting any diet. This includes intermittent fasting. It's not for everyone. Um, so here's a list of those who probably shouldn't fast. Children and adolescents or people over 70. People with low BMI. Women who are pregnant or nursing. People with chronic heart issues. People with kidney or renal issues. If you have a history of a food disorder like anorexia, bulimia, or binge eating, you probably shouldn't intermittent fast. If you're frail, you shouldn't intermittent fast. If you've recently been in the hospital. Athletes who are training. Ideally, your diet is being monitored by a nutritionist or doctor, and you're coming up with a meal plan that makes sense for what you're trying to accomplish in your sport. People with hypoglycemia, those whose blood sugar is naturally below normal. People with low blood pressure. Intermittent fasting can lower blood pressure. Brittle diabetics or people with difficult to control diabetes. Now, as always and forever, consult with your doctor. Just because you're diabetic doesn't necessarily mean you absolutely cannot try intermittent fasting. In some cases, IF can safely be practiced by people with diabetes as long as they're under the supervision of their doctor. Bottom line, consult your physician. All right, so beyond weight control, what are the other health benefits of intermittent fasting? Improved fat loss, especially around the midsection. Improved mental clarity. You experience spikes in human growth hormone, which helps to improve lean muscle mass. And I'll actually go more into that in a minute. Intermittent fasting lowers insulin levels. Intermittent fasting also induces something called autophagy. And I'll talk a little bit more about autophagy later because it's a really important aspect of fasting. It lowers blood pressure. It improves your cholesterol profile. Practicing intermittent fasting is thought to reduce the risk of certain diseases like cancer and Alzheimer's disease. When I first started, I wasn't exactly sure what was happening when I fasted. So in this first video of this intermittent fasting series, I'm going to talk about what's happening in your body when you fast, um, which will help you understand some of the benefits I just mentioned. So a fast starts the minute you finish eating. So within 68 hours of your last bite, the stomach breaks down the food you've eaten into their component subunits, just regular old digestion. So proteins are broken down into amino acids. Carbs are broken down into monosaccharides like glucose. And fats are broken down into fatty acids. Those are your macros, your macronutrients. The pancreas releases insulin into our bloodstream and this insulin transports glucose into our cells to be used for energy. If you have an excess amount of glucose, it's stored in the liver into glycogen to be used later or stored in fat cells. So as you fast, you burn through glucose first, then glycogen, and then you start converting fat, the byproducts of which are released to your cells to be used for fuel. When your body doesn't have enough sugar or glucose for energy, your body needs a new energy source. Um, so fatty acids are released into our blood by our fat cells. They travel to the liver where they're broken down into these water soluble molecules called ketone bodies. And ketone bodies contain ketone groups or ketones. Um, and you've probably heard of ketones if you've heard anything about the ketogenic diet you're forcing your body to metabolically switch from burning sugars to burning fats and going into ketosis. The same state your body enters into when you're doing the keto diet. So at that point, your main source of fuel is ketones. Ketones are an alternative fuel that um, is made in your liver when there isn't enough glucose or sugar um, for energy. So once ketones are made, they are released from your liver and they go into your bloodstream and are used as fuel to drive the body's metabolism and to support muscle function. And this is a normal process for everyone. It happens overnight when we sleep and it also happens when we diet or fast. This is where it starts to get interesting. Insulin disrupts the production of something in your body that helps you increase bone density and gain muscle. And that something is a hormone called human growth hormone or HGH. When you fast, you experience a drop in insulin, which results in an increase in the production of HGH, which is great news because HGH production typically declines 10% every 
decade we age, and this leads to bone density loss and muscle loss. This boost in HGH during a fast can help you increase bone density and maintain and even regain muscle mass. As your fast continues, your body starts to remove damaged molecules and cells in order to regenerate new healthy cells in a process called autophagy, which um, I mentioned earlier. Auto means self and phage means to eat. So essentially eating oneself. It sounds savage, but it's actually really helpful. During this process, our body metabolizes broken and dysfunctional proteins that build up inside of our cells over time. It also repairs DNA and protects against oxidative damage. Um, and as a result, this reduces inflammation and enhances our cells um, energy machinery, which is called mitochondria inside our cells. And that has really good metabolic health and anti-aging benefits. Increased autophagy could be protective against several diseases, including cancer and neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease. And actually, Alzheimer's disease is characterized by this accumulation of abnormal protein in your brain. So if you're fasting, you're presumably breaking down all of this junky protein and clearing it out. Now, no diet is necessarily perfect, and this one uh, definitely has some notable cons. Um, some people could experience uh, headaches, mental fog, heartburn, um, definitely cravings. Um, I experienced three of those things during the first week or so of trying this. I had headaches, mental fog, and cravings, not to mention the fact that I was kind of a cranky bitch, and these things shouldn't be ignored. So for me, they were temporary, and I was able to kind of just push through. Um, you need to listen to your own body. Don't continue to do it if you feel like you're gonna pass out. If you're just being a whiny baby like me, uh, then maybe give it a few more days. Before we learned how to farm, people, as you probably are aware, uh, hunted and gathered food to survive. They would go really long stretches of time without eating, um, and it took a lot of time and energy to hunt game and gather nuts and berries. The human body adapted to that by using whatever energy stores it had. And not only did it adapt to survive, it adapted to thrive. Fasting has evolved to promote mental clarity, which makes sense if you're trying to find substance and you need to be sharp and aware. Um, it evolved to improve bone density and muscle mass so that you can be more uh, of an efficient hunter and gatherer. Um, it evolved to promote cellular, cellular self-cleaning and metabolism of dead cell components, which decreases inflammation and um, chronic diseases. The adversity of having to deal with food scarcity made us better survivors and thrivers, and the um, abundance of a Western diet doesn't necessarily complement this way of being. In fact, it's pretty contradictory. Anyway, just something to think about. I've got a few more videos about fasting in the pipeline. Um, I'll talk about different fasting plans so that you can figure out which one might be best for you. Um, among other things, I'll talk about fasting and exercise. And I'm really excited to talk about fasting and longevity and not just living a long time, but doing so without many, if any, chronic health conditions. So uh, fasting and vitality. In the meantime, check out this playlist with more videos about the science behind health and wellness. As always, thank you so much for watching. I really hope you learned something that'll help make your life better. I appreciate your time and I will see you in the next video. Thanks. Bye.